Today I'll be teaching you how to sew a blouse. We'll be working on McCall's M7900. This is a great blouse pattern because all the techniques are pretty conventional and it has really cute details such as puffy sleeves, neckline ruffle and a waistband ruffle. This is a really great pattern and I recommend it to everyone. Let's get started! Today we'll be sewing McCall's M7900 in view B. Check out the back of the pattern for the full list of materials and the lengths required for your size. The top tab of the pattern has the bust and waist measurement for the pattern size. Here's what you'll need to make this cute tailored blouse. You'll need at least 1.1 meters of soft blouse fabric like cotton, eyelet, poplin or denim. I'm using a soft linen. You'll need some fusible interfacing. If your interfacing is wide like mine, then you'll probably only need about half a meter. This blouse uses a few pieces of haberdashery. You'll need 1.2 meters of single fold bias binding, which is 1.3 centimeters wide. And 70 centimeters of elastic, which is 1 centimeter wide. You'll need 4 buttons, which are 2 centimeter diameter. And of course, you'll need a matching good quality thread. You'll need all the usual sewing supplies like a sewing machine, scissors, tailor's chalk, and an iron and an ironing board. For blouses, we use our bust measurement to choose the size of the pattern. I'll be using size 12 since my bust size is similar. This pattern comes with four different cup sizes as well. Use piece 1 for A and B cup, piece 2 for C cup, and piece 3 for D cup. To find your cup size, you'll need to measure your bust and upper bust measurement. Your bust should be your widest point on your chest. Then move the tape measure to under your armpits to make the upper bust measurement. Refer to the instructions for what cup size you are. The difference between my bust and upper bust is just over an inch, so theoretically I would use piece 1. I ended up using piece 2 or the C cup because it fit me better when I made a twelve. To make view B, you'll need to cut out pattern pieces 1, 2 or 3 and pieces 5 to 9 and 11. To cut out pattern pieces, simply follow the line for your size all the way around the outside of the pattern. The front piece has dart seams. This means that we cut into the dart and it will have a seam allowance. Carefully follow the line for your size as it can be easy to mix up the cutting line and the dart. The back piece also has dart lines but don't cut into these lines. We'll be making view B for this pattern, which is the shorter version. When we cut the fabric, we need to cut along the higher hem for view B. You can do this by simply folding the pattern piece up to the hemline for both the front and back bodice pieces and the facings. I made a lot of adjustments to my pattern, so I decided to trace the pattern out so that it will be easier for you to see. Please note that I added darts at the top of the bodice back piece to help with the fit. This is not in the original pattern. We'll start by cutting out the main fabric in pieces 4 to 9, 11 and your bodice front, which is piece 2 for me. The instruction sheet has the cutting layouts. Follow the layout for your size and the width of your fabric. My fabric is about 115 centimeters wide, so I'll be following the first layout. Fold your fabric in half widthwise. Take piece 5 and place the short side of the rectangle arrow directly on top of the fold of your fabric. This is called cutting on the fold. Pin into place and do not cut on this side in the future. 
place piece 6 next. All pieces with a grey line arrow must be placed parallel to the selvage, or in this case, the fold of the fabric. Use your measuring tape to make sure that the distance between the grain line arrow and the fold are the same down the length of the grain line arrow. Pin the rest of piece 6 into place. Place piece 7 on top of the fold and pin. Pin piece 8 next to the selvages and a line of the grain. Pin piece 4 on top of the fold. Use your shears to cut around the outside of the pattern piece. The triangle markings on the edge of the pattern are called notches and they are very important for matching the seams. Make these markings on your fabric by making a small triangle outwards from the edge of the pattern. Cut out all the pattern pieces that you've pinned so far. Pin piece 9 on top of the fold under where you previously cut. Place your bodice piece next to the opposite salvage and pin. Place piece 11 on the leftover space and pin. Cut all these pieces out. You'll need to interface pieces 8 and 9. Fold your interfacing widthwise so both of these pieces will fit on the fabric. Make sure that the distance from the selvage to the fold is the same down the length that you need. Place piece 9 on the fold and pin. Place piece 8 next to it and align it with the grain. Cut these pieces out. My interfacing is the fusible type, which needs to be ironed onto the fabric. Lay out the pattern pieces you cut onto the ironing board so that the wrong side is facing up. Lay the interfacing on top. You must make sure that the shiny side with the glue is facing down on top of the fabric. Press your iron down on top of the interfacing until it's completely glued onto the fabric. Do this for pieces 8 and 9. Before I start sewing, I like to make all the dot markings to help bring the blouse together. The dot markings on the armholes for the bodice front and back pieces need to be marked onto the wrong side of the fabric of Taylor's chalk. These will be used later for aligning the sleeves to the armhole. Pin next to the circle marking that you want to copy and fold the pattern on top of the circle marking. Use Taylor's chalk to make a line from the circle marking to the raw edge. Do this next to the fold of the pattern. Do this for both copies of the bodice front and back. A few of the markings need to be made onto the right side of the fabric. On the bodice front piece, there is a dot at the center front corner and at the square neckline. Use the same method to mark these with Taylor's chalk. First up, we need to mark and sew the darts for the bodice front and back. I'll be using carbon paper and a tracing wheel to do this. 
Grab one of your bodice front pieces. Pin the pattern to the right side of this piece. Take your carbon paper and place it directly underneath the fabric. The die side of the carbon paper should be facing up towards the fabric. Take your chasing wheel and run it along the dart line for your size. On the wrong side of the fabric, you'll have a perfect line for the dart. Do this for both copies of the bodice front. Make sure that you turn the pattern over for the second copy. We'll now bring the lines for the dart together, which is easy for this dart since the raw edges should come together too. I like to push the needle into one line and out of the other horizontally to bring the dart together. Fold the fabric in half using the needles. Make sure that both of the dart lines stack up on top of a pin, then pin the entire dart. Do this for both copies of the bodice front. On your sewing machine, we sew down on top of the dart line. As you reach the end of the dart, adjust your sewing path so you can make a few stitches directly on top of the fold at the tip of the dart. Don't back stitch. Pull the fabric out of the machine and cut the thread so that it leaves a long tail. Sew the dart for the other copy of the bodice front as well. Knot the end of the dart by hand a few times. Piece 2 for this pattern also has a dart, one for each side of the bodice back. Copy and sew the darts onto this piece as well. Lay the bodice back on top of the table with the right side facing up. Place a copy of the bodice front on top with the right sides facing together. Pin these pieces together at the side seam and shoulder seams using the notches to guide you. Pin both copies of the bodice front to the bodice back. Sew these pieces together at one and a half centimeters. This blouse isn't lined, so we need to neaten the edges so that they won't fray in the future and so that they'll look nice on the inside. I'm going to do a top stitched finished edge. To do this, you need to fold the raw edge in half so that it's hidden on the inside. Pin in the fold. Do this for all of the raw edges on the bodice. Sew directly on top of the fold. The seam allowances look neat and tidy. I'm now going to work on sewing the neck ruffle. Take piece 5 and fold it in half widthwise. Pin the short ends together and sew together at 1.5cm seam allowance. 
Sew again at about 1.4 centimeters on the corner with the fold. Trim off the seam allowance at the corner with the fold by cutting diagonally. Turn the neck ruffle the right side out and iron the corner out nicely. Pin the raw edges of the neck ruffle together. We'll now gather over the raw edge of this piece. On your sewing machine, change the stitch length to the maximum on the straight stitch. Pull out the upper and lower thread before and after you sew. Make sure that the ruffle lies flat. Sew at about 1.3 centimeters from the raw edge. With your fabric, sew the gathering stitch at 1 cm and 2 cm from the raw edge. At this point, we need to mark the two triangle markings on the raw edge of the neck ruffle with Taylor's chalk. To gather the ruffle, you need to take one thread from both rows of the gathering stitches on the same side of the fabric. Gently pull these threads as you push the fabric slightly with your fingers. Lightly gather the length of the ruffle. Take your ruffle to the bodice that you've sewn so far. The raw edge of the ruffle needs to be placed on top of the raw edge of the neckline. The chalk markings that you made on top of the ruffle show where it needs to be placed directly on top of the shoulder seams of the neckline. Adjust the gathers so that you can align the chalk markings and also so that the ruffle is flush with the neckline. Pin into place. The end of the ruffle needs to be placed directly on top of the chalk marking that you made at the corner of the neckline. Do this and pin. Try to make the gathers as even as possible by running over them with your fingers. When you're happy with how it looks, sew over the ruffles at 1cm to hold it in place. Moving along to the bottom ruffle, this is made from pieces 6 and 7. Place both copies of piece 6 on top of piece 7 with the right sides together. Match the triangle markings. Sew these pieces together at 1.5cm and iron the seam split flat. Once again, fold the seam allowance in half and top stitch directly on top of the fold to make a neat finish. We need to make a narrow hem on the sides and bottom of this ruffle. Take your ruffle to the ironing board. Fold the sides and the bottom raw edge by 1.5cm on the wrong side. Use your iron to make a permanent fold. Here's how to neaten out the corner. I've unfolded the ruffle so that I can see the crease at 1.5cm. At this corner, I cut diagonally from the crease to crease to get rid of some of the excess fabric. Fold half of the raw edge to make a knee finish. Iron into place. Fold up the hem at the sides and bottom and pin. Sew directly on top of the fold to hold the hem in place. At the corners, push the needle into the fabric and lift the foot so that you can turn the fabric. Put the foot down and keep sewing. Hem both sides and the bottom of this ruffle. On the top of the ruffle, we'll be sewing gathering stitches at 1cm and 2cm, just like with the neck ruffle. Don't forget to use the long stitch length and pull threads out of the machine before and after you sew.
pull two of the gathering threads to gather the bottom ruffle. This ruffle needs to be sewn to the bottom of the bodice. Place it on top of the bottom edge of the bodice so that the raw edges are together. The seams on the ruffle must match the side seam of the bodice. Here's how to match the seams. Line up the two side seams to be aligned and place them right sides together. Use your tailor's jaw to make a marking at 1.5cm from the raw edge on the seam. Fold along one of the layers at this marking. Move around the top layer so that the seams are aligned. Pin the two layers together. Do this for both of the side seams of the bodice. Sew over the seam and one and a half centimeters without back stitching. Check how well the seams match. The bottom corner of the ruffle needs to be placed on the dot marking on the corner of the bodice that you made earlier. Adjust the gathers so that you can align the edge of the ruffle with this marking and the raw edges are flush together. Run your fingers over the top of the gathers to make sure that they're even, then pin the entire ruffle. On your sewing machine, sew the ruffle into place at 1.5cm. Carefully cut off about half of the seam allowance for the waist ruffle seam that you just made. To needle in this raw edge, I'm going to use bias binding. My bias binding is about 1cm wide and is pre-folded, which is convenient for binding seams. We need to wedge this raw edge into the fold of the bias binding. Pin the bias binding into place, but leave the raw edges open at about 1.5cm from the corner. We do this to prevent bulk when sewing over the corner in the future. Sew directly on top of the edge of the bias binding. We're now going to sew and attach the facing to the front opening of the blouse. Before we sew, we need to make a few markings on the facing. Use your tailor's chalk to make the circle marking in the bottom corner and neckline corner on piece 8. Do this on the wrong side of both copies of piece 8. The facing is made from piece 8, which is the front, and 9, which is the back. Pin both of piece 8 to 9 at the straight edge. Match the single notch. Sew the facing pieces together at 1.5cm. Iron the seams split flat. These seams won't be seen, so I'm just going to finish them by zigzag stitching on top of the raw edge. Change your stitch type to a long and wide zigzag stitch to do this. We also need to zigzag stitch on top of the inner edge of the facing. This will be the edge that has all the curves. Take the facing over to your ironing board. Fold up the raw edge of the facing by about 5mm on the wrong side. Pin into place. Back at your sewing machine, sew close to the raw edge of the hem you just made. The raw edge is now nicely tucked away.
Before I sew the facings onto the blouse, I want to make the markings for the buttons and buttonholes. I'm using a removable fabric marker to do this. This marker is very accurate, but you must not iron over the top of it or the markings will become permanent. So I need to sew the buttons and buttonholes quickly. I'm going to mark the buttonholes first on the left hand side of the blouse opening, which are marked by these bars. Pin the bodice front pattern piece to the fabric using the raw edge as a guide. Pin next to each of the buttonhole markings. Then remove the excess pins so you can fold the pattern piece over on top of the first buttonhole marking. Use your fabric pen to make the vertical line close to the raw edge and then the longer horizontal marking. You won't need to make the other vertical line because I'll be doing a one step buttonhole on my machine. Repeat for all four buttonholes for this view. When we sew the buttonhole, the intersection of the two lines will represent the start of the buttonhole. Moving on to marking the buttons. Pin the pattern to the right side of the blouse and pin next to each of the buttonhole markings. The button needs to be sewn on the intersection between the horizontal line for the buttonhole and the center front line. Fold along the first button marking. Make a cross marking on your fabric to represent where the button needs to be sewn on the center front. Do this for all four of the buttons. I'll now sew the facing onto the bodice opening. The facing needs to be sewn on the bottom and inside edge of the opening. Firstly, I'm going to pin away the bottom ruffle on both sides of the opening so that it won't be caught in the facing seam. Pin into place. Do this for both of the bottom corners. Pin the rest of the facing to the bodice. Match the corners and the seams. Make sure that the neck ruffle is lying flat because it will be sewn into place with this seam. To help place the facing on the bottom corner of the bodice, match the circle marking at both of the bottom corners. I suggest starting off sewing the seam at the top of the dot marking at the bottom corner. Sew at 1.5cm. Sew another seam at about 1.3mm to reinforce each of the corners. The bottom edge of the facing is hard to line up with the waist seam since I've already cut off the seam allowance. I'm pinning the seam allowance to the facing so that it's straight. Sew the bottom edge of the facing to the fabric at 1.5cm. Sew the bottom corner again at 1.3cm to reinforce it. Trim the seam allowance to about half. Trim off all the seam allowance at the corners. Only cut up to the reinforcing seam, never into it. When you pull the facing the right way out, the corners will look nice and defined. Cut triangles into the seam allowance over all the curved areas of this neckline. Zigzag stitch on top of the raw edges to prevent them from fraying. Pull the facing the right side out. Unpick the gathering stitches for the neck ruffle. The facing seam needs to be understitched to help it stay on the inside of the blouse. This is where we sew the seam allowance onto the facing side. Open up your facing seam and push the seam allowance towards the facing side. Pin into place. On your sewing machine, you'll need to sew on the facing side with about 5mm seam allowance to the facing seam. As you sew, check that the seam allowance is moving under the facing side. You won't be able to understitch the corners of the facing, but that's okay. Just sew as close as possible to the corners without catching any other fabric in the seam. 
Do this for the whole facing seam, but not the bottom of the facing. We normally sew the buttonholes last, but I want to remove the fabric markers without accidentally ironing them onto the fabric, so I'm going to skip ahead with sewing the buttonholes. Here's how to do a one step buttonhole. Load a button onto your buttonhole foot. Take off your normal sewing foot and load the buttonhole foot into the machine. Pull down the buttonhole lever on the left. Push this behind the bar on the left side of the buttonhole foot. Change your stitch type to the buttonhole stitch and decrease your stitch length to less than 2. Remember that you need to go back and forth from the buttonhole setting each time that you do a buttonhole. The blouse needs to be inserted into the machine so that the opening is facing towards you. Move the fabric around so that the lines for the buttonhole markings is in the middle of the opening for the buttonhole foot. Press down on the foot and the machine will start sewing. When the buttonhole is finished, do a few back stitches and then cut the thread. Repeat this for all five of the buttonholes on this blouse. Place a pin at one end of the buttonhole. Use your quick unpick to rip from the other end of the buttonhole up to the pin. The pin prevents you from ripping too far. We need to sew the buttons onto the cross markings on the other side. Thread your needle with a double strand of thread and knot. Push the needle through the wrong side of the fabric and up to just beside the cross marking for the buttonhole. Thread the needle through the wrong side of the button and down through the hole on the other side. Push the needle through the fabric next to the buttonhole marking just a few millimeters away from where you started your stitch. Pull the thread through to create a loop. Note that I'm going to hover the button several millimeters over the top of the fabric. We do this so that we can create a shank for the button. This is where a stack of thread creates space for the other side of the blouse opening. Keep sewing loops onto the buttonholes that you've chosen while hovering the button over the top of the fabric. Here's how to make the shank. Under your button, create a loop going around the outside of the button. Pass the needle through the loop and pull through. Repeat this at least five times to create a nice covering to the stacks of thread. Pass the needle through the wrong side of the fabric. Now we knot off. Create a loop on the fabric. Pass the needle through the loop. Pull the thread to pull the knot down onto the fabric. Repeat this a few times then cut off the thread. Repeat this for all five of the buttons. Press the seam allowance of the lower ruffle towards the bodice side and pin into place. On your sewing machine, sew just a few millimeters away from the waist seam on the bodice side. This will keep the seam allowance facing up. Now we'll sew the cute puff sleeves. There's a few markings that you'll need to make on the wrong side of these sleeves. Mark the three circle markings at the cap of the sleeve with tailor's chalk. Pin next to each of the markings, then fold the pattern over next to the dot. Draw a line with the tailor's chalk. We also need to mark the line for the elastic casing on the sleeves. Pin the pattern to the fabric above the placement line. Fold the pattern along this line and make the same line onto the fabric with tailor's chalk. Do this for both of the sleeves. The dot at the center represents where the sleeve needs to be attached to the shoulder seam of the bodice. The two side dots represent the start and end of the easing stitch that you need to sew. Sew the easing stitch between these markings exactly the same as the gathering stitches for the ruffles. Don't forget, you must not back stitch and leave long strings afterwards. Do this for both sleeves. Bring the side seam for the sleeves right sides together and pin. Sew the side seam at one and a half centimeters. 
finish the raw edges. Bring the sleeve the wrong side out and place it on a sleeve ironing board if you have it. Or place a small piece of cardboard inside. Next you'll need to hem the sleeves. Fold up the raw edge of the sleeve by 1.5cm on the wrong side. Use your iron to make a fold. Fold under about half of the raw edge to make a nice hem and iron. Pin the fold into place. On your sewing machine, sew on top of the fold that you just made. Repeat for both of the sleeves. The casing for the sleeves is made from unfolded bias binding. Place the edge of the bias binding directly on top of the placement line you previously made. Pin the bias binding in place at bottom edge. Cut the bias binding so that you have an extra few centimeters to encircle the sleeve. The opening of the casing is where we will insert the elastic. At this seam we're going to fold the raw edges of the bias binding onto itself so it will be hidden away. Take your attachment off your sewing machine and slide in the sleeve up to the bias binding. Sew directly on top of the top and bottom edge of the bias binding. You need to sew as close to the edge as possible, there's not much space for the elastic. Do this for both of the sleeves. Grab your elastic guide, which is piece 12. Cut the elastic so they will be at the same length as the guide. You'll need a safety pin for the next part. Hook it onto one end of your elastic. Use a pin to hold the other end of the elastic near the casing. Push the safety pin into the elastic casing opening. Push it all the way around the sleeve and out through the opening again. Pin the two ends of the elastic together so that the ends overlap. Make sure that the elastic in the casing isn't twisted. Sew the end of the elastics together by sewing backwards and forwards several times. Do this in at least two positions. Push the elastic fully into the casing and cover it with the ends of the bias binding. Thread your needle with a double strand and knot. Push the needle in through the back of the casing to hide the knot. To sew up the casing opening, I'm going to make very small diagonal stitches from one edge to the other. Do this until you reach the bottom and knot off. The elastic casing is all done. The sleeve looks cute and frilly.
We now need to attach the sleeve to the bodice. These sleeves are lightly gathered at the top, so they're quite easy to sew in. When you insert the sleeve into the armhole, you need to have the bodice the wrong way out and the sleeve the right way out. Match the big and small notch markings on the sleeve and the armhole. First, I'm going to match the side seam for the bodice and sleeve. Sew over these seams at 1.5cm to check that they match. If it looks good, then you can go ahead and start pinning the sleeve to the armhole. Match the two circle markings on the side of the armhole with the sleeve. Pin the bottom half of the sleeve to the armhole. Pull the gathering stitches to lightly gather the top of the sleeve. Push around the gathers with your fingers until they're even and the width is about the same as the armhole. I'm concentrating the gathers at the tip of the shoulders for a more dramatic effect. Tie the end of the gathering threads together to hold the gathers in place. Place the marking at the top of the sleeve directly on top of the shoulder seam for the bodice. Pin into place. Do this for both of the sleeves. Slide the armhole into the machine. Sew the seam at 1.5cm. Once the sleeve is sewn in, unpick the gathering stitches. We can now sew down the facing onto the seam allowance for the shoulder seam. Pin the facing down on the wrong side of the neckline so that it's nice and flat. With a needle and thread, make a few horizontal stitches to sew the edge of the facing on top of the shoulder seam allowance. Make sure that your needle isn't piercing the right side of the blouse. Do this for the other shoulder as well. This seam is quite exposed on the inside of the blouse, so once again I'm going to cover it with bias binding. Trim off about half of the seam allowance. Fold the bias binding on top of the raw edge. Top stitch on top of the edge of the bias binding. The blouse is all ready to wear and looks super cute. In this pattern tutorial we learned how to make puffy sleeves, how to make cute ruffles and how to make buttons and buttonholes. I hope you enjoyed this video so please like and subscribe. Look out for our next pattern tutorial on this YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.